introduce Ian Gibson, one of our most prominent members, a lifetime member of SWIMS, who is going to introduce our speaker, Michael Burke. And we're so welcome, glad to see you, Michael. It's a terrific opportunity for all of us. Okay. Hello, everybody. We're in for a treat. So I've known Michael Bug for 25 years, mostly in the context of the Pacific Northwest Key Council. And that's a group of people who got together starting in 1975 to develop keys that would help identify mushrooms in the Pacific Northwest, by which we meant BC, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and part of Montana. And dozens of people have been involved in that over the years. Um, and Michael Buke has been um, one of the main leaders through all that time, um, both in um, being president and um, um, encourager and contributing in many ways. Uh, the result is that there are now 70 keys or articles um, developed for that purpose, and they're online at this point. Also during that time, a result of that uh, group of people working together is um, the Matchmaker program, which some of you will know, now called Michael Match. It's the same thing. And uh, Michael Bug was uh, uh, an important contributor to that effort as well. So if we go back way back to the beginning, um, Michael um, was almost expelled from elementary school. He did not like elementary school, apparently. And uh, he was um, involved in many activities which were um, not part of the curriculum there. But he was rescued in um, high school by an interest in chemistry. And he kept that interest up um, through three different high schools and three different chemistry teachers and was determined to become a chemist. And eventually, he um, got a PhD in chemistry at the University of uh, Washington. What uh, impressed me with the um, his actions in the Key Council was not only his um, wide competence and his work um, um, capacity, habits, but also his um, uh, dedication to his uh, friends, family, colleagues, students. Uh, he always liked being around people. And um, that comes about because of his wide interest. Now, chemistry has, pers has persisted through that time, but he was also drawn to writing, photography, reading extensively, um, editing. He um, plays golf, he skis, he's a fisherman, he's a cello player, he is interested in social justice. He's interested in conservation, pollution control. He's an organic farmer. He grows his own grapes. He makes wine. And the only thing that he's not drawn to, obviously, is sleeping. But he's obviously um, jack of all trades and um, master of many of them and um his his many contacts and interests has put him in the position of being able to um work in collaborative situations with people from different backgrounds and get get projects working that uh require those different backgrounds and um and uh, make connections between them so uh, an example of that is his involvement with uh, North American 
Mycological Association, NAMA, and um, he has played leadership roles in in toxicology, still does, and in uh, editing the Mycovania journal there and in education where he's helped put together a lot of slideshows which they lend out. Um, second example is um, when he was working at uh, Evergreen, which he did for 32 years, after a, a year teaching at um, Harvey Mudd uh, College, um, they started up uh, with um, Steve uh, Herman, an ornithologist, a, a project um, called the, the Ecology and Chemistry of Pollution. And one of the things that they did there with their students uh, researching was to try and uh, oppose a mass spraying of uh, a forest of the forest uh, there um, in an effort to get rid of the Douglas fir tussock moth. And while they did not succeed in preventing the spraying, uh, the research that they did um, about the effects on the forest of DDT uh, played a large role in the eventual banning of the DDT. And a third example is um, a kind of um, mushroom key um, with an emphasis on um, photographs as, as the, the main component of that key. And that's what he's going to talk to us about later on when he starts to speak. And um, I'm really looking forward to it. This story is about why I wrote an entirely new kind of mushroom book. And it really is the fault of uh, Dr. Joe Amirati at the University of Washington, who asked me about 12, 14 years ago to see if there were any cordonarius mushrooms growing underneath the oak trees, because I live right on the edge of an oak grove. And I said, no, I'd never seen any. It happened to be November, which was a lucky coincidence, but I agreed to go out and take a look. And I didn't find any in my woods, but in my neighbor's woods, I found four or five different species of cordonarius. I photographed them, wrote them up, sent him the information, and he says, those are all new species, every single one. And a week or so later, I was out at Sincline Winery pursuing my wine interest, and the owner there is very interested in mushrooms. And he said he had beautiful cordonarius mushrooms out behind the winery, but he couldn't find them in any books. And so I went out there and found five or six more cortinarius that were different than the ones I'd found. And they were all new species as well. And I'm now somewhere between 50 and 100 new species of cortinarius in the oak woods near my home. So that was the start of it. But in studying those mushrooms, I found the cortinarius mushrooms, I found a lot of other things that other people had never seen and never reported and photographed. And so Joe in turn a couple of years ago and encouraged me to turn it into a book. I don't think he imagined what I was gonna do, but this is what I've done. So Mushrooms of Cascadia is the book and here's the cover and back cover. Uh, about over 900 of the photographs in the book are my own and the rest were all done by my mentors, Kit Skates Barnhart and her husband, Harley Barnhart and my former student, uh, Paul Stamets. And the books, after uh, the, some initial pages that talk about where to, how to find mushrooms, how to collect them, how to curate them, how to cook them, the real book starts on page 17 with the key. And all the rest of the book is a great key to the mushrooms. So you start, I move around with the arrows. We start with the, if it's guild fungi, you go to page 175. I mean, key lead 175 on page 139. If it's a club, you go to page 168. But my idea was to guide people through a book and get them away from what I see most people doing with their mushroom books. It's just thumbing picture by picture until they see something they recognize. So I'm trying to guide them. And so there's three pages of this introductory key. And here's the last uh, two pages. So it covers the puffballs and the and the gastros and the polypores and the ascos and the bolites. And the last key lead is the chanterelles and that's key lead 4A. And so the other thing I've tried to do is put things together in alphabetical order. 
which you see in, in most books, I've tried to put all the things that are likely to mistaken, be mistaken for each other or confused with each other together on one page. So we have the Cantharellus formosus group, for example, which we now know has four or five species. I don't know how to tell those apart yet. I mean, I'm sorry, not four or five, four species, but Cantharellus cascadensis, the cascade yellow chanterelle, which is distinguished by a white underside versus the more egg yellow. Rosio canis with a really, really bright egg yellow underside and Cantharellus subalbidus with a pure white underside. So people can easily look and tell which chanterelle they have, for example, and tell them easily from some of the false chanterelles like Turbinellus flaccosus, which is toxic, uh, Craterellus tubeformis, which is a good edible, and Craterellus calicornicopioides, which is an incredibly good edible. So in the book itself now, I'll talk about some of the individual mushrooms that we discovered. Cortinellius velingae is one of the early ones that I found. And when we started looking in California, and I think it's also turned up on Vancouver Island, there's this beautiful Cortinarius that can reach the size of at least a lunch plate, sometimes the diameter of a dinner plate. And we named it in honor of uh, Elsie Belinga at uh, UC Berkeley. And then this is one of the mushrooms we found out at Syncline Winery. And we named that Cortinarius albo sinus because it starts out white before it, it gets uh, exposed to the sun, but then it turns lilac. The gills are initially lilac, very, very gorgeous mushroom. But then as of course the spores mature, those gills are going to turn from lilac to uh, rusty brown. And another one of the mushrooms that I found in the first two weeks of hunting uh, these Cortinarius is Cortinarius amabilis. Now this photograph doesn't do justice to this Cortinarius. It is just plain electric yellow. Uh, it's almost a glow in the dark mushroom. And, and so I get really excited about all the different courts. But then uh, hunting uh, for the oak courts at the base of an oak tree, I found this mushroom, which I had no idea what it was. It was actually spotted by a friend of mine who lives up near Jasper, who is hunting with me. And he said, oh, here's a bunch of uh, Russell uh, uh, Zerampolinas. And I ran over and he says, well, it never grows in a clump. And I realized instantly, well, this is no Russula. And here's an idea of the size of that mushroom. This is the same mushroom, same clump. Two weeks later, you can see my hand in the photograph, this great, big, beautiful sarcomyxa. Now, we, I had no idea what this thing was. So I posted it uh, to Mushroom Observer and nobody had any idea. David Aurora got so excited about it, he jumped in his car and drove up from California to come look at it. And it turns out to be a close relative of Sarcomyxa serotina, which most of you would know as the late oyster mushroom, Pinellus serotinus. And then I decided to take a, a, um, a tissue sample of that, mush of that unnamed Sarcomyxa, because Paul Stamets was very interested in the fact that it didn't seem to decay. It just held on and on and on. And we grew it up in culture and I get this beautiful, completely different colored mushroom. And the mushroom appears now to have gone extinct in the wild. I can't find it anymore. I only found it on two adjacent stumps of oak uh, near my house, uh, but now it's in the American culture collection. And when it was still a little tiny primordium and, and I was starting to grow out the culture you see this picture of, I broke off one of the primordia and I wanted to know, is this edible? Now you shouldn't eat a mushroom until you know exactly what it is, but how are you gonna find out on an unknown mushroom? It turns out there are three total sarcomyxes in the world. Sarcomyxa edulis from China, Sarcomyxa serotina, uh, from uh, North America and Europe, it's very widespread. And this one, and I said, okay, this has got to be edible. And it was the most delicious, best cooking mushroom I've ever cooked. So when it got mature, these big ones, I cut off one of these big ones and sauteed it up, but it made my mouth tingle and I got a little nervous about it. So I never ate it again. So here's Pinal Sarcomyxis serotina, the late oyster mushroom that I was talking about. And down in the inset, down here on the right, you can see it from the top. And here's an underside view. 
But what's really intriguing to me about this particular picture is to look at when I took the photograph. January 3rd, 2010, the temperature outside was 10 degrees Fahrenheit. I mean, that's way below zero Celsius. Um, and it, there was about four feet of snow on the ground. It hadn't been above freezing for three weeks. And this mushroom was warm, toasty, completely unfrozen. And I realized then that a young mushroom that's actively growing uh, produces a lot of metabolic heat and doesn't freeze, even in the winter. So now I hunt mushrooms year round, by the way. And I, on one key council foray we had at the mouth of the Columbia River, it was in November. It was a really cold November. All of the waterfalls in the gorge were frozen solid. All the mushrooms we found were frozen solid. I walked out on the grounds of our retreat center, which is about 10 miles from Portland. And um, there under some spruce trees was a whole bunch of king bolete, including a couple of bolete buttons that were so big, I couldn't even get my hands around the stem. But since they were buttons, they were completely warm, toasty, even though it had been freezing at that point for a couple of weeks, freezing cold enough that all the surrounding mushrooms that were mature were frozen solid. So a little side note that I picked up. And then also in pursuing the, the mushrooms of the oak forest, uh, walking a, a short distance from my house, I came across this mushroom Pseudoinonotus dryadeus growing at the base of an oak tree. And it was three feet in diameter. And it turns out Pseudoinonotus dryadeus is an annual mushroom. I was absolutely stunned that a mushroom could grow so big, so fast. And down here in the lower left is a young pseudoinonotus dryadeus that was growing alongside my driveway. And then right outside my office, in fact, if it was daylight out, as I'm looking out my window, it would be 20 feet away, was this thing that I thought might be another pseudoinonotus dryadeus. Notice when I cut it, it looks about the same inside. The spore print, however, of this mushroom is white. The spore print of this mushroom is brown. So here we have a mystery polypore that I'm waiting to identify in one that's growing literally right outside my window. And so far, I've only found about 15 spe new species growing right outside my window from where I'm sitting. So it's a neat place to live. But for a long time, I thought this was another pseudoinonotus dryadeus, just a different form. But this thing turns out to be a perennial, not an annual. It has a white spore print. The spores look virtually identical to the pseudoinonotus, but we have a perennial oak growing polypore and that it can be about twice the size of a dinner plate in diameter and it lives for years and years. And there's lots of these things around. And yet it wasn't in Mycomatch. It wasn't in Matchmaker. Nobody had paid any attention to it. And and then walking uh, in my woods, I picked this uh, fairly dull chestnut colored uh, Ario boletus, picked it up, looked at the underside, the Citrinoporeus is just a beautiful golden uh, uh, lemon yellow, uh, gorgeous, gorgeous mushroom. But this is one of the ones where if you don't like flavor and you don't mind slime, you can eat it. Uh, but otherwise, it's just a beautiful thing to see, and it's an oak associate. And I only find it on one stretch of woods. I find it every year. I found it day before yesterday when I looked. And this year, we have almost no large mushrooms growing. It's just been the worst year in 50 years. But there's a few things around. And the other thing that most people don't see in the Pacific Northwest is butter bullies. In this, this is Butyri boletus quercy regius. And this is another photograph from very near my house uh, within about a one minute walk of where I'm sitting right now. A very, very delicious mushroom. Uh, the, the, two, the little inset image is exactly the same mushroom. I just picked it out of the ground and turned it on its side and re-photographed it. So we have a blue staining bolete. Now I usually don't eat blue staining boletes because many of them are bitter. But this one is absolutely delicious. Not quite as good as a king bully. Then the biggest, then the, the one here in the center was uh, fully as big as a dinner plate in diameter. And, uh, but my favorite of them all is uh, 
the Boletus edulis complex. And the one that I've just, I've related Boletus modii, uh, some people would call Boletus fibrolosis, but it's so corrugated and so different in look from uh, Boletus fibrolosis, fibrolosis that I maintain it's probably a different species but I'd like to find it again and put a name on it. But all of the mushrooms in this particular group are in the Boletus edulis complex. These are the mushrooms that are still in the genus Boletus. If it's not related to edulis, it's been moved to a new genus or will be. And Boletus reginius down here is the queen bolete. It grows in the fall and normally it would be fruiting right now, except it's not happening this year. The king bolete, Boletus edulis, and this is edulis variety edulis. Uh, in our area it grows uh, starting in mid-July and uh, continuing through October up in the mountains and then is showing up down uh, around sea level normally at this time of year or on the ocean where we have both this edulis and a slightly more orange capped uh, edulis thing or reddish orange which is Boletus edulis variety grand edulis and maybe the best tasting uh, edulis king bolete group of them all is Boletus borosii, a very white uh, cap bolete that is that favors the hotter, drier areas. And uh, it's one I rarely see, uh, but if you get down into California and Mexico and into Idaho, you'll find a lot more Boletus borosii. So this is the king bolete group. And 90% of what I eat is in the king bolete group. And what isn't showing here is uh, Boletus rex verus, uh, which is the spring king. And so here's all the chanterelles put together in one image so that people can readily uh, see the difference between Rosia canis, Cascadensis, Subalbinus, and the Cantharellus uh, formosus group. And some lookalikes. So on the left, top left, we have Polyozelis atroazulinus. Now, uh, just a few years ago, we thought the only polyozelis uh, that we had in all of North America was polyozelis multiplex, but it turns out polyozelis multiplex is limited to the East Coast. We actually have three different polyozelis species, and I've only found two of them. They look very much alike. Polyozelis atroazulinus is one, and then just as they were about to publish the paper on polyozelis, I've been looking for a polyozelis for three years, hadn't found a single one. And then I found this one down in the very lower right-hand corner and that uh, I was able to photograph and get the DNA in time to get it in the paper. And we named it for a, a very fam favorite key council member who's now passed on, um, Mary Margaret. Uh, and uh, she's the founder of the uh, journal, Mushroom the Journal. And, uh, she was suffering Alzheimer's, but she knew that she'd had a beautiful, beautiful mushroom named after her. But what really interests me here is Craterellus calicornicopioides. Now, most of you will be looking at this image right now and saying, oh, he's got it wrong. This cannot possibly be calicornicopioides because calicornicopioides only grows with oaks and it's black or gray. It's never this color. And yet, and I talked to uh, Noah Siegel about this. He said, oh, you've got a new species there. We sent it out for DNA and it is Craterellus calicornicopioides from a completely different habitat and a completely different color than we're used to seeing for that particular species. And Gomphus clavatus is a very, very delicious edible uh, as is calicornicopioides. But Gomphus clavatius is uh, very readily attacked by worms, so I've never actually eaten it. The polyozelis species are edible, but they're really much better used for dyeing silk and wool. But when you get started identifying mushrooms, it's really important to learn to identify ammonitis and tell the good edible ammonitis from the poisonous ammonitis. Ammonita clyptoderma is edible, not incredible, but it's edible and okay. And it's distinguished from, ammoni by, from ammonite phloides by the fact that it has little striations along the edge of the cap, except that ammonite clyptoderma doesn't always have the striations and ammonite phloides sometimes does. And ammonite clyptoderma can sometimes be white. 
Ammonite phloides can sometimes be white. Ammonite ecliptoderma can sometimes be bronze. Ammonite phloides can sometimes be bronze. This is why I never eat an ammonita, even though technically some of them are really, really delicious, but I don't trust myself. Ammonita ocreata is also laden with alpha amanitans, which is the toxins of ammonita phloides. And when I first found this thing on the right here, ammonita opconicobasis, uh, I thought I had found another ammonita ocreata, uh, but it is subtly different. And it's only found from two sites, the Columbia Gorge in Southern California. Uh, but whether it's edible or not is something I'm never gonna learn. But again, this has striations on the edge of the cap. The ocreata doesn't, except that sometimes it does. So I'm not gonna ever try and find out if obconical basis is edible or not. Now, all of the ammonitas that don't have a ring on the stipe, and no annulus, no partial veil, are in the vaginata group. And so there's nice big ones like ammonita pachycolia, ones that have a constricted vulva at the base, ammonita constricta, and then others that are just plain uh, uh, ammonite uh, vaginata group. Uh, this particular one is going to be named in honor of Jan Lindgren, another key council member. And uh, I find it regularly about uh, 30 miles north of my house at 4,000 feet, which is where this photograph was taken. But the thing to note is sometimes ammonite phylloides will lose its ring. And I have one case of somebody in Oregon who sat down to a meal of ammonite phloides thinking he was eating an ammonite vaginata group. And he realized that in time to get to the hospital within an hour or two, so there was no harm done. Uh, but again, I wouldn't eat these things. Now, here's the real shocker for you. In my book, I've got ammonite muscaria variety flavi bulveda. However, we don't have muscaria variety flavi bulveda in Cascadia at all. What we have is Ammonita chrysoblema, which was named clear back in 1918 based on a white cap Ammonita muscaria lookalike. Ammonita muscaria variety Flavi bulveda grows in California. It has not yet been found outside of California. But everything that's been analyzed through the rest of North America, except for up in Alaska, turns out to be Ammonita chrysoblema which, as I say, was first identified based on a white cap, but Chrysoblema can have a yellow cap, an orange cap, a red cap, a brown cap, or a white cap. How are you going to tell them apart? You look down at the base of the stem. This bulbous base has at least three rings of tissue around it, and that marks something that's Ammonita muscaria, a complex. Ammonita aprica is closely related. This was named by Jan Lindgren. And because it's a spring ammonita and has an apricot color, for and ammonita alpinicola is is another one of the spring uh, ammonitas that are closely related to muscaria. For a long time, we didn't have, know whether these two species, alpinicola and aprica, were were toxic or not. But in the intervening years, people have eaten both alpinicola and ammonita aprica, and I can assure you, it's something you do not want to do. They have exactly the same toxins as the ammonite muscaria complex. And closely related with the same toxins as the ammonite muscaria complex is ammonite pantheroides. We know it as ammonite pantherina most typically, but pantherina has not yet been found in North America to our knowledge. And we have a lot of different things in the pantheroides uh, group. And it can be anywhere from uh, a pure yellow like ammonite gemata to uh, to a dark, dark brown. And years ago, in the, in the around 1980, I was looking at the chemistry of these things. And I found that the darker the cap, the more ibotenic acid and musimol the mushrooms had. And as you got uh, more and more yellow, uh, there the lower the levels of toxin. So possibly you could eat ammonite gemata, but you would not want to eat one of these ammonite pantheroides. I've got a case that uh, Dr. Uh, Stunts, who was my other mentor from the University of Washington, he told about a family in Chehalis. Now, these toxins in uh, the ibotenic acid in Musimol are water soluble, unlike amatoxins, which are not water soluble and don't decompose on heating. 
you can actually detoxify ammonite pantothenoides and ammonite muscaria by boiling them a couple of times in water, carefully discarding the water, and then eating what remains. Now, I don't know why you'd bother with it. I have eaten some of the stuff that David Aurora has prepared, and it's okay, but why bother? But the problem here was the family didn't know they had to throw away the water. They used the water to cook spaghetti, and the neighbors heard all this crashing and banging. They came into the house. A lot of the furniture was broken. Chairs were, uh, were tipped over, and they rushed the, the couple off to the hospital. While they were at the hospital getting that couple treated, the teenage son came home, oblivious to the wreck of the house, sat down, ate dinner, and the neighbors got home just in time to rush the son to the hospital as well. Now, death from these mushrooms is extremely rare. It's rather hard to do, although somebody has died from hypothermia because you can fall into a deep comatose sleep and in high doses, that coma can last, the comatose-like state can last up to 70 hours, in which time you dream that people are sticking needles in you, trying to throw you off cliffs and other unpleasant uh, nastiness. So these are not good mushrooms, but these, by the way, the Ammonite and and Pantheronoides are legal hallucinogens, both in the United States and Canada, way more dangerous than the illegal hallucinogens that we have that I'll talk about later. Another mushroom that we have uh, that you need to know about on the West Coast is Ammonite smithiana. And smithiana is purely a Western mushroom, but it's occasionally mistaken for Tricholoma merleanum, the white matsutake. Now, some of you might be familiar with the name Tricholoma magnifilari. It's a lookalike, but it grows on the East Coast. Our West Coast mushroom was actually named uh, over 100 years ago, Merillianum, and that name got lost. But now that we know we have a unique species, the name has been resurrected, this white matsutake. So how do you keep from getting poisoned uh, with Ammonitis smithiana when you're out after matsutake? Well, they both end in a point, but Ammonitis smithiana has this big bulb above the point. And the uh, matsutakis taper uniformly from top to bottom. Now, if you lay the stem of one of these mushrooms, like this mushroom here, in the palm of your hand, and you squeeze down hard with your thumb, indeed, squeeze down with all your might, nothing will happen to the mushroom unless it's wormy, in which case it'll blow up. Now, if you squeeze down hard on Ammonina muscaria, I mean, Ammonina smithiana, nothing will happen either until you start to squeeze with all your might, and then it is, explodes into shards of pieces. So that's one way to tell the Merleanum from the Smithianum. But the other trick that I learned from uh, Christian Swartz is that cut the Merleanum with a knife, cut the stem from the cap, and the knife will squeak in a very distinctive squeaky sound. Do that with Smithiana, no squeak. So we can call the Trichoma Merleanum the squeaky mushroom. And David Aurora says, and I agree that it smells like a uh, cross between cinnamon red hots and dirty gym socks. Well, I think the smell of Ammonina smithiana smells like chlorine, but there's some people who swear they cannot tell the difference in smell between the two. So use the other test. Now here's uh, turkey tails. I get lots of questions about turkey tails. Is this a turkey tail? Is that a turkey tail? People send me endless photographs. So I want people to really know how to identify a turkey tail. They're thin fleshed. They have small pores on the underside when you look at the bottom of the mushroom. They can be a lot of different colors from the top and they grow only on hardwoods. So you find a thin flesh mushroom with white pores on the bottom and you've got a turkey tail. And I am very excited about the medicinal potential of Trimedes versicolor. I won't go into the reasons. There's still a lot of research being been done it's actually uh, one of the mushrooms in phase two trials for a possible COVID treatment. And there's a lot of other uh, interesting things I can talk about if I had a lot of time. So here's things that people mistake for turkey tails that aren't. If you turn it over and the underside is smooth, no pores, you have a sterium. This particular one is sterium complicatum. But notice that from the top, it looks very much like a turkey tail. Turkey tails could be that color but they're not gonna look like that underside. Burkandra adusta, when you turn it over, it's sort of grayish underneath. It's not nice white pores. 
Trimetopsis cervina, which I had never found. And there was no photograph a couple of years ago in uh, Mycomatch. Uh, and I found this just down the road from my house. I turned it over and we see all these teeth underneath. And here's another thing that looks like a uh, turkey tail from the top, but you turn it over and it has sort of a spiny edged uh, pores, but they're violet in color, they're not white. So this is how you uh, sort out the, the turkey, the false turkey tails from the true turkey tails. But here's my favorite of all uh, of the polypores, uh, the Brigiopores nobilissimus. I've never found it myself. Uh, and uh, Jim Goon sent me a photograph of this young uh, Brigiopores uh, nobilissimus. Jim was a student of mine at Evergreen. He now works with Paul Stamets. And so here's a photograph of Jim that Paul took with a mushroom they call the Green Lady. Now, the interesting thing about Brigiopores nobilissimus is I, I maintain, oh, this is an incredibly rare mushroom. I've been looking for it for 30 years. I've never found one. And I keep hoping it can live for 50 or 100 years. It can live long enough for trees to be growing out of the top of it. And you, it's only found on old growth noble fir. It, it might be a, a stump. It might still be a living tree, but it's only there. However, if you do DNA analysis, virtually every tree in the forest, conifer or not, has Brigiporus nobilissimus DNA. So here's one of the most common widespread fungi around, but it rarely produces a fruit body. So we consider it to be an extremely rare mushroom. I'm still looking, I'm still hoping to see one. Now some polypores uh, that are potential uh, of interest as edibles are uh, Albatrellus avalanius. These things are, all of these things are a little bit tough, but all of these things can be eaten I suspect if you cooked them in a pressure cooker, you would soften them up and make them quite uh, delicious. But I am particularly intrigued by Albatrellopsis flutii because one of the things I said in the book is, do we have Albatrellus confluence in North America? Well, probably not. Well, it turns out when you do the DNA of Albatrellopsis flutii, it's identical to the DNA of Albatrellus confluence in Europe. The interesting difference is Albatrellus confluence in Europe never has a trace of blue, not even a, the slightest bit of blue. And here you have this gorgeous electric blue mushroom and it fades. Here, you, This is a faded Albatrellopsis floodii, but it's genetically identical to Albatrellus confluence. Scudigerylisii is another edible one, a little bit distinctive because of that matted cap and uh, it was once in Albatrellus, but because of the different morphology, it's been separated out. And in the polypores, I'm also intrigued by some of the woody perennial polypores uh, for medicinal uses and other uses. Fomitopsis officinalis agaricon shows a lot of promise in a, in, as a medicinal mushroom. And the, uh, the coastal uh, Native American tribes, uh, basically from Washington North, would gather this thing and they'd carve it and use it as talisman in their canoes. And the medicine men would carry that, this mushroom in their medicine pouch, but more to use as, as, a, as a rattle or as an object than to use as a medicinal mushroom. Fomis fomentarius, if you, if you find a nice big sample, it's also known as amidu, you can uh, take the center of it and that punky material will hold a spark. So when you've built your campfire at the end of the day and it's uh, before the fire goes out, you take some of that spark, you nest it in the material of the Fomis fomentarius, wrap it up in, uh, in, in a leather pouch and it'll hold that ember till the following day when you wanna start another fire. The other night, neat thing about Fomis fomentarius or Imadu is that you can pound that felty material and you can make beautiful purses, beautiful hats. My, my, my hats of uh, made of amadou that are gifts from Paul Stamets are so soft and so succulent. It's just amazing and light as a feather. But if you wear the hat in the rain, you suddenly realize it's a fungus because it smells just like a fungus as soon as it rains. And there was also uh, ancient and ongoing medicinal interest in Fomis fomentarius. 
in Ganoderma organensi is closely related to uh, Rishi and that there's a lot of interest in it as a medicinal mushroom. Now the Ganoderma organensi differs from the Fomi and the Fomi topsis species in that it's an annual mushroom. It grows big and beautiful, but in one year, at the end of the year, it dies and it's gone. Now, what got me started mushroom hunting was morels. I was a toadstool kicker until graduate school when somebody gave me a bag of morels and uh, I, my wife and I, we had just gotten married. We cooked those morels up. They tasted like New York steak. I, we just couldn't believe how delicious they were. So later in the summer, uh, when I was out steelhead fishing on the coast, I, at the mouth of the Elwha River, we picked uh, three grocery bags full of these beautiful red mushrooms with the little white dots all over the top, brought them to the University of Washington and tried to find somebody who could tell us what they were. Nobody had a clue. We finally got introduced to Dr. Daniel Stuntz who said, oh, that's just Ammonitum muscaria. And uh, we took a class from Dr. Stuntz that fall and started to learn about mushrooms. So this is 1968, 69. And that was the beginning of my mushroom tour is, is that. And I've looked and looked and looked my whole life for Morcella populophila. I have found it once ever. And when I looked uh, in Mycomatch to see how edible it was, it didn't talk about edibility. And so I said, well, I got to cook this thing up and find out whether it's a good edible or not. It is an incredibly good edible. It's one of my top favorites. In fact, this particular slide shows my four top favorite edible uh, morels. And uh, Morcella brunia is a hardwood associate. And it can grow uh, quite large, as you can see from my four inch along uh, Swiss Army knife. Sometimes it's small. It can be very hard to distinguish from a mor morel that I named along with Andrus Wojtek from Newfoundland, Morcella eohespera. Now we thought it might be Morcella norvegiensis. So Andrus went to Norway with the person who discovered norvegiensis. He found that the type locality had been washed away. It was only known from the type locality and so we went ahead and we couldn't confirm what Norvegiensis really was. And so we named this thing Eohespera because Andrus had found it in Newfoundland the same week I found it here in Washington state. And all the black morels on the East Coast, except for uh, the garden uh, mushroom uh, morel, the landscape morel are different than the West Coast morels, except Morcella Eohespera. In, and uh, Andrus picked out this name, Eus for the god of the sunrise, Hesperus for the god of the sunset, because we found it on both sides. And when we were researching the paper, we found that uh, this mushroom is present uh, as in samples from Switzerland, all over uh, Norway, Sweden, China, uh, the, the Soviet Union. And, and since we uh, published the name, there was an extensive search for all the different morels of Norway, and they did turn up Norvegiensis, which matched uh, the genetic uh, code that we had found for Eohespera. So our name became a synonym. But it's an incredibly delicious mushroom. I, until this year, I thought it only grew high in the mountains. I now know that more, this morel, Morcella Eohespera, I prefer that name to Norvegiensis, I'm sorry even though it's not correct, grows all the way from sea level to uh, snow level, uh, four or 5,000 feet high is the highest I've ever found it. it I thought it was originally uh, only associated with spruce because that's where both Andrus and I had found it. It's now been found associated with hardwoods and a wide range of conifers. It is the probably the most abundant morel of uh, non burn morel in Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and I'll bet even up in uh, British Columbia. The and other really interesting morel, morel is Morcella snideri because it grows in clumps. And the thing to know about Morcella snideri, and it's true about some other morels, it, the pits, can, the ridges here can start out fairly pale, but they're always going to turn black in age. But the pits can be burgundy, they can be black, they can be tan, they can be green, a whole range of colors. 
but Snyderi almost always grows in clumps, sometimes 10 or 15 mushrooms in a clump. Sometimes the individual mushrooms are a foot tall. One day I saw a commercial mushroom picking friend of mine. His car was parked in a four-year-old clear cut. Now, everybody knows that a four-year-old clear cut has nothing, nothing of interest. So I called him and I said, why was your car, where were you hunting? Because uh, he usually hides his car. He says, well, we were in the clear cut. We picked 700 pounds of morels in that 40-acre 40, 40 clear cut that day. I went back the next day with three beginners. We filled our five gallon buckets each in an hour. And we continued going back for three weeks, loading up on Snyder Eye, an incredibly distinctive, delicious morel that grows in the same place year after year. Brunia tends to grow in the same place year after year. So does Eohespera. A lot of the other morels, you've got to find a new patch every year. Popula phyla got its name because it's normally under cottonwoods. But when I finally found it, it was in a pear orchard. So here's Maggie Rogers with Marcella tridentina, which is a, another black morel. And this is a black morel where the ridges don't turn black. And it's not black at all. But how do we tell the difference between a black morel and a blonde morel? On this morel that Maggie is holding, you can follow the ridges pretty much straight from top to bottom. You cannot do that with a blonde morel. Marcella americana is our most common blonde morel. It's found throughout North America and it is our most common blonde morel in the in West Coast. Although we do have three different species of blonde morels or what also known as the escalinoclade morel. And by the way, Maggie Rogers is the woman for whom Mary Margarete, Paulio Zellis, Mary Margarete was named. Beautiful woman, beautiful mushroom. Now, Marcella eximia is one of three different burn morels that are extremely difficult, if not impossible to tell apart, except from DNA. I know this is, D is exactly eximia. It grew in a forest fire that I thought was gonna engulf our house, but uh, fortunately the wind was blowing the other way and we escaped. And this became part of the study where eximia was renamed from France. I had sent the mushroom samples to France so this is, this is actually a voucher DNA sample of Morcella eximia, one of three virtually identical burn morels. Now, the interesting thing about eximia, like a Schneider eye, the pits in between the ridges can be pink or green or brown or tan. The ridges start out pale, but they'll always turn black in age. Marcella tomentosa actually is in a completely different clade from all of the other morels, and it's a burn morel. But the unique thing about it is it doesn't grow, it doesn't start to fruit until all other morels are done. And in a good year, it will fruit from July until snowfall. So if you want to fall, find morels in August and September, and I've seen huge collections from August and September go to a forest fire. And sometimes Morcella tomentosa will fruit in where there's been a forest fire two, three, four, even five years after the fire. So this is a very, very delicious, very, very meaty, thick walled, wonderful morel. And, but the neat thing about it is it starts fruiting when everything else is done. And the morels, of course, are ascomycetes. And I wrote the, the co-authored with the Bassets, Ascomycete Fungi of North America. I developed a real love of ascos. When I started the book, I knew Jack Diddley about ascos. I learned about ascos by writing the book. And when I was uh, with Anders Wojtek in uh, Newfoundland, uh, I, was, I was there with Tom Volk, and we wanted to find alder tongues, Tephrina occidentalis. Well, we failed, but I've now found them close to my home. So this is a neat mushroom here. Those tongues that you see are not fungi. The, the mushroom, the Tephrina, causes this deformed growth of the alder cone, the seed cone. And the spores are just produced loose on the surface of the tongues. The tongues overwinter and they turn very dark brown, almost black by spring. Now over here, we have a little tiny uh, Cudoniella clavus that I photographed. I did not even see these two Pizoloma celiaferas until I was pro processing the photograph. I had no idea what the heck they might be. I, I sent uh, the information to, uh, to Germany at uh, Adolf's uh, suggestion. 
and found out, I got a name for it as Pizzaloma celiifera. Now, here's another a, a really special photograph. Uh, and Adolf and, uh, and Ian were present when we uh, made this collection near Mount Rainier. This is a single elk dropping down in the lower corner. And you know the size of an elk dropping. I've blown up just a portion of it. And it shows this white uh, this mushroom with, with long white hairs. That's Lasiobolus cuniculi, cun, cuniculi. And then this beautiful orange mushroom, which was the only one I saw. And the, I thought it was the only one I was photographing, Kylimania stercoraria. Absolutely incredible under a microscope. And, Danny Miller and all of us sat around the microscope that night looking at this one piece of elk dropping. And we found five different mushroom species on that elk dropping, including a little tiny uh, Cop coprinus type uh, species. And uh, now moving on, the Lactarius, uh, these aren't actually true uh, guild mushrooms. They're not related to a Garrix. They're in this completely separate group. Uh, Russellas and Lactarius have very brittle flesh. They break crisply and cleanly like a, like a piece of chalk. And uh, a couple of them, Ruby Lactus and the Deliciosus group, do not give off copious milk. But you can see the Deliciosus group has an orange milk. And the Ruby Lactus has a reddish milk. And then there's this thing here that I see all over my property. And I looked at it for five years. And I finally realized last year, I needed to send in a sample for DNA and get it uh, named. It has a sort of a very watery white milk, but the Deliciosus group has at least uh, five different species. Now I just noticed the D got dropped off of that. That's delish, should be Deliciosus, not Eliciosus. And um, related closely to the Lactarius are the Russula species. The Russula, the, the Brevapes complex are in what we call the compacti group. They're really, really compact flesh. The um, Rushula emetica is something that I've long said is a, is a Rushula that we don't have in North America. It's a bright red Rushula with pure uh, white spore print. Definitely not here. Well, it turns out it's all over the place. It can be pure white, pure red, pink, or any combination in between, including cream. So this is the true Rushla emetica. It's hotter than blazes, and it's it's a pretty uh, soft textured mushroom. The stem breaks very easily. Then we thought we knew uh, Rushla fragrantissima. We've got uh, at least two species. We don't know what they are. They're not named, but they all smell like a cross between uh, benzaldehyde or almond extract and baby vomit. So there's the Russell Frank Antissima complex waiting for somebody to tackle and name. And then there's the Russell Zarampolina complex. Now, I once uh, in Idaho found this beautiful lemon yellow uh, Russell that I said, hey, that's a Zarampolina. And what I was basing it on is it bruised brown at the base of the stem. And the gills were slightly orangish. They weren't a pure white because Russell Zarampolina has a yellowish orange spore print. And so I bet Kathy Cripps a case of beer because she insisted it couldn't possibly be Russell Zarampline if it was pure yellow. And uh, pretty soon the Russell expert for North America showed up at that Namifor and he said, oh yeah, that's just uh, a Russell Zarampolina before it's been exposed to the sun. And it turns out this mushroom can be red, yellow, green, purple, uh, almost black, every color in between. It can be very smooth. It can be a little bit felty rugose. Really incredible mushroom. But when it's mature, or when you bring it into a room, uh, a warm room, this usually doesn't work out in the woods because when it's cold, you can't smell things as well. It has a very shrimp-like or crab-like odor. And all of members of the Russian Zarampolina complex are edible. Russian Brevipes gets interested in eaten after it's been parasitized by Hypomyces lactiflorum, and Hypomyces lactiflorum turns it into the lobster mushroom. Now we're nearing the end, and we come to my very favorite edible mushrooms, uh, the bear's head and the lion's mane. And yesterday I found the lion's mane mushroom about this color, 
and uh, it probably weighed four or five pounds for the one mushroom. You slice it like it was a piece of ham uh, that you were gonna uh, heat up for breakfast in the morning. You cook it in butter and oil until it's lightly browned on both sides and then serve it with a bit of salt. It has incredible lobster flavor. Now, if you run to the store, you can buy Herisium arenaceus. It's a very delicious, very uh, edible mushroom, but it doesn't have that wonderful lobster flavor of the wild mushroom. Now, every year when I teach a three month cl class in mushroom identification, the favorite mushroom of the year for the whole class is the bear's head, Herisium abietus. They've never seen a Herisium arenaceus. They're a little harder to find. And Herisium uh, abietus, the bear's head, we found one uh, just about 30 miles north of my house with the class one day. Uh, it was about 30 feet up in the tree. The students, by standing on each other's shoulders and using a long stick, managed to knock it down. It took 20 students three days to eat the one mushroom. And it was just so incredibly delicious. So here's a close up of the teeth on the edge. It differs from Coraloides, it has teeth all along the branches versus just teeth at the end of the branches. And uh, herisiums are just so delicious. And the, I have herisium arenaceus every single day. I use uh, the Paul Stamets uh, mushroom capsules, which are the uh, mycelium uh, plus uh, some dried uh, uh, lion's mane that I purchase and grind and encapsulate. Because uh, studies in Asia have shown that people that, are, that consume Herisium arenaceus uh, tend to live longer, have lower levels of uh, Alzheimer's and dementia, and uh, it tends to slow the progression of Alzheimer's and ALS. Now, it hasn't been through formal phase one, phase two, and phase three studies, but it's a heck of a good edible, and it might be incredibly valuable to me, so I make sure I eat it every day, along with just a little bit of psilocybe, Cubensis, I take about two tenths of a gram of Psilocybe Cubensis because Paul Samus uh, research has shown that at least in culture, if you combine Herisium arenaceus extract with uh, the uh, Psilocybe uh, Cubensis extract, you the neurons in culture grow faster than with either two alone and indeed faster than the sum of the two separately. So there seems to be a significant uh, effect. And at two tenths of a gram of, psilocy of psilocybin, uh, psilocybin cubensis, I'm way below any detectable dose because for me, well, it takes ounces of psilocybin to affect me. Most people, if they took one gram of, of cubensis, they, they would feel it. Uh, but I'd have to have at least a hundred grams. And so I don't mess around with it as a hallucinogen, but as a medicinal mushroom, I also have started just this summer using cubensis daily along with my lion's mane, both as the mycelium and as the uh, dried fruit body, just in case uh, the fruit bodies are better than the mycelium, but I do both. So that ends the talk. Now, uh, to accompany my book, I have a website, mushroomsofcascadia.com, and that website tells you where and how to order the book. And uh, in addition, I will put, regularly post updates to the book, corrections. Uh, we will soon be posting a whole bunch of updates and corrections. And I, in all of you hopefully know about Michael Match, an incredible program. I was able to write the book I did because of the existence of Michael Match. I don't have full descriptions in my book, but Michael Match has way better descriptions than you will find in any mushroom book. And so the combination of, of, of my book plus Michael Match makes a really powerful tool. And I know that uh, and I, I love the Mushrooms of British Columbia book. Every mushroom in that book is found within 40 miles of my home. And, uh, but the two together, you, you've got the keys in my book and the descriptions in, uh, in uh, the Mushrooms of British Columbia. And I wanna congratulate you all for, for your new BC book, which is sold out currently. My book is not sold out because it's a little bit hard to get. And especially if you live in Canada. And what I worked out is as follows. If people order 10 or more books at a time from me, I charge $20 a book. 
Otherwise, it's $30 a book. And that includes uh, that the $30 a book includes shipping, but not to Canada, because it cost me $22 to ship a single book to Canada. So I, I recommend if you're in Canada, if you get 16 people together, that's the cheapest way of shipping a book to Canada. And then uh, it, it works out to about $4 per book for the shipping plus $20. The other problem with trying to order the book uh, direct yourself is I have to have money in US funds from a US based bank. And a lot of folks uh, don't have access to ways of paying me. And so if you get to, but, uh, but Kim Luther has worked all of that out. So if you connect with them and you want a whole box of them, or if you've got friends in Blaine, I can ship to Blaine and it would cost $21 a book for 10 or more books shipped to Blaine. And I give that deep discount to help out my friends in Canada. I tried to find a Canadian distributor, but my book is considered an independently published book. And because of that, no bookstore will carry it no distributor will distribute it. And uh, so think about who your publisher is. But fortunately, I did not go with, with the, my initial publisher who, uh, who I, I, won't, I won't name names, but I got discouraged from going with them because that publisher is reticent to make corrections. I have full control of my book and I'm printing it in small batches and as names changes and things update, I'll be printing new editions. And that's it. Thank you. Excellent. Super duper. What a fabulous talk, guys. Now, we're going to do some uh, uh, question and answers. Kurt, have there been any coming up in the chat? Uh, Michael, how much uh, the collection was done by Sugsdorf? By Sugsdorf. Well, he made 10,000 accessions. They're all at the University of, of uh, at Washington State University in Pullman. But as near as I can tell, um, an, a, an awful lot of what I found and named, he never collected because I don't think he, well, there's two things. Climate change has made the mushrooms start to grow in November when usually we'd be frozen solid in November. And a lot of the mushrooms I, that I found and identified that are new, that weren't already named, are named as a result of um, finding that of global warming. Because if Joe Amirati had asked me to go out and look for quaternaries in September or October, I would have told him there aren't any under oaks. So I don't think Sukstor saw any of these mushrooms I'm talking about. And none of the ones that I know of bear his name. So I think he was mainly collecting and identifying things that were already named. I don't think he named a lot of things himself. He named a lot of plants himself. And Sukstorf lived about uh, 10 miles from where I live now. I've seen his, his home and there's a lot of Sukstorfi uh, plants around, but I don't know of any mushrooms. Thanks, Thank you, Adolf. Any more questions, Adolf? Anybody else? I had asked about the Sarcomyxa serotina, and I was wondering if they were growing on the oaks in the forest that uh, Michael is in there, or if they were growing on other species of trees. As far as I can tell, I've only seen them on on conifers. Oh, okay. that I found some yesterday. I don't I don't find them on the oaks, but I think that photograph that I have was. I'd have to look at the photograph again. That was not a conifer. I'm pretty sure that was a, a maple branch. So it may not be highly uh, selective in what it grows on. And by the way, send me that C-Link information. But if I'm selling a single book, it's $30 a copy plus shipping and whatever else. If I'm selling 10 or more, it's $20 a copy. And that's the other advantage of getting a bulk order together. By the Michael, way. we'll get something going. All yep. right. You've already sent three boxes to Cam. Yep. Yep. And uh, <laughs> I'll talk to Cam and see what we can do. Um, and uh, hello there. Uh, yeah, two actually. Uh, one is I have uh, some friends and family. I'm in Canada, but I have friends and family in Washington State. So 
in in the U.S., uh, the best procedure is to place an order direct with you for delivery in the U.S. Certainly, I mean, technically, uh, order through Fungi Perfecti, uh, which ships from Olympia, Washington. Okay. Because Paul Stam has paid all the costs of producing this book, and he owns Fungi Perfecti. Okay, and the second question, which is a little more facetious, it would help my zoogeography a lot to know exactly where you live. Uh, halfway between Mount Adams and Mount Hood. Okay. Smack in the middle of the Columbia River Gorge. Yeah. And the neat thing about this location is if you go 15 miles west from where I live, Rainforest. you're in 100 inch a year coastal rainforest. Yeah. If you go 15 miles the other way, you're in shrub steppe semi-desert. 20 miles north or 30 miles south, you're in alpine. So we have virtually every ecosystem in all of Cascadia from Alaska to California within 40 minute drive of my house. Maybe. When does the Boletus Rex Veris start showing up? Um, it, I haven't fi figured out where the patches near my house are, but near my house, they start in April, although I haven't found them yet. The main fruiting is May, and I have some higher elevations there where the last fruiting is around July 4th. Thank you very much. If there are no other questions, um, I'm going to call it a day. And I'd like to thank you, Mike. That was incredible, um, uh, excellent. And you, the internet great. held up. I can't believe it held up. You know, I, I don't know how, I would, how timing worked, but hopefully it worked pretty well. And thank you, Mike. Okay. For all the work that you've done of producing a fabulous book. I hope we can arrange some. I'll talk to Cam and we'll see if we can get the books over. All right. Because I know all it's right. people are wanting them. Okay. And I'll give you a call in about five minutes. All right. Oh, okay. Great. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Have a good night. Thank you very much. Night, all.